Hello people, I'm Ginny Metherill and I am a fourth generation witch. Today's video is about that wonderful tool of witchcraft, the crystal ball. Now it has come to my attention that some of you are watching Ginny Metherill without subscribing. The audacity, as people would say. I can't do that voice very well, can I? The audacity. No, I can't do it very well. But I would so much like it if you did subscribe. Now, many of you might have seen last week's video about the witch's ball. Now, the crystal ball and the witch's ball, of course, are intertwined. And if you haven't seen the video, I'll put it here for you. But with this intertwining, of course, the crystal ball has much more venerable history. So what I want to do in today's video is to go through a little bit of the history and the past uses of crystal balls and then come round to how we might use them and show you what to do with yours. Crystal balls have been used throughout history. As I've said previously, the Native Americans, the Iroquois and the Pawnees did use the crystal balls. The Yucatan Peninsula has yielded several crystal balls when these were known as Zaz tons and they were considered great healing energy that due to its roundness the energy contained within it came out equally on all sides so it was a very useful piece of equipment. The ancient Chinese also were invested in a crystal ball and in fact one of the largest clear quartz crystals in the world which currently resides in the Pennsylvania Museum of Antiquities and Art was once owned by the Empress Dowager Shishi, if I've pronounced that word right, who was presented with this crystal ball which I believe came from Malaysia and it was displayed in her palace. Ancient Egyptians were also known to have crystal balls. They were not adverse to a bit of scrying in their time. Let me tell you that. In fact, they spent a lot of time scrying, did the ancient Egypts. One of their pastimes and hobbies. Quite a fun one, I think. So it was mainly the ancient cultures who used the crystal ball to begin with. And the crystal ball itself was known by people such as the Roman. Pliny the Elder, that wonderful Roman historian, did write that soothsayers were wont to hold a crystal ball and gaze into it. And in fact, the word crystal comes from the ancient Greek, meaning frozen ice or clear water. And there is a little bit of a dichotomy between those two phrases, but that's because there's no real explanation of the word crystal in our language. So it's sort of an amalgamation of those two. Of course, it was considered by the early Christians to be the work of the devil, but not so for the later Christians. This is Leonardo da Vinci's picture of the saviour of the world. And as you can see, Christ is quite blatantly holding a crystal ball. Mm, quite a cult, I think. Elizabeth I, that wonderful English queen, had appointed as a court astrologer the magnificent polymath John Dee. John Dee was a mathematician, he was an astrologer, he was an occultist, he was an alchemist. He was interested in all things of the esoteric nature. And he had a crystal ball, which we still possess today. He called it his showstone, and in it he gazed and gave the future to the great Queen Elizabeth. And she was very impressed by this because he was her court astrologer for all of his life. Early users of the crystal ball often would have a green one made from the mineral beryl. This green mineral was supposed to be more magnetic and conductive and therefore not only could it give you a greater energetic output but it could connect better with the moon and it is considered by all those in the know that the moon guides crystal balls. Of course why wouldn't it? The moon, that beautiful, lovely lunar orb, looks just like a beautiful quartz orb. Of course, the great wizard Merlin had a crystal ball, which was green and made of beryl, which he would whip out at every opportunity in order to give that wonderful King Arthur some predictions about battles and future. So it is said. However, who knows, he possibly did have a crystal ball. It was considered part of the Druidic tradition. And in fact, this is shown in history today. There is such a thing as the Scepter of Scotland. 
Now, this scepter was made in Italy in the 1500s. It was a gift from the Pope at the time to the Scottish monarchy, and they created this beautiful scepter and inlaid it with Scottish pearls and a Scottish globe. This globe was said to belong to a very powerful druid from many years ago, and scepters, in fact, are normally shown to have a large orb in the top of them. The Christian faith in the early common era decided that soothsaying crystal balls was pagan and therefore should be suppressed, and so it was not considered as something particularly wanted or required. However, this did change, and by the 1500s, crystal balls were really quite the fashion, as was seen by Elizabeth I, you know, having John Dee with his showstone. The abbot Trithemius, who was a Benedictine monk in the 1500s, he was a great occultist and learned man, and he believed that we should all have crystal balls. And his idea of how you should use a crystal ball was as follows. First of all, you must find yourself a clear, good, lucid crystal. The size not much bigger than a small orange. Now bear in mind that oranges nowadays are much bigger than the oranges that they had in the 1500s because we have you know, grown them on so. So a small orange, it would be something that would fit probably in the palm of your hand. However, the abbot Trometheus didn't think that this was enough. What you had to do with your pellucid clear crystal was then take it and then wrap half of it in gold and then place that on a gold or ivory stand. And from that point, you could then begin your crystal gazing. Jolly expenses is all I can say, but very pretty. Of course, we can't really talk about the crystal ball without mentioning the Romani nation, those gypsies of old who were known for their crystal ball scrying. Now, I want to talk about one particular gypsy, and that is Urania Boswell. She was born in the 1850s as Urania Lee. Now, in England, the surname Lee and the surname Boswell are basically the two huge gypsy family surnames. And so when she, as a Lee, married Mr. Boswell, I think he was called Peregrine, was he, or Perry Boswell, they created the King and Queen of the Gypsies, and she was known as the Queen of the Gypsies. She was a brilliant seer and made loads of very fascinating and true predictions. Four years before the death of Queen Victoria, she said that Queen Victoria will see the leaves fall four times more before she leaves this mortal plane, and the king who will succeed her will last not as long as Urania herself. And of course, both these predictions came true. She also predicted her own death, but she predicted the weather on the day of her death, because she said, in three days from now, I will be dead, and on that day, it will rain. But amongst other things, my favorite prediction of hers is concerning George Washington Vanderbilt, who was the great-grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt, that magnet of American business who built the railroads. It is said that, in 1911, that George Vanderbilt and his wife Edith were both at Henley Regatta. Now, Edith saw that Urania was there with her tent reading fortunes. So she went into the tent and had her fortune read. Urania looked into the crystal ball and said, do not get on the Titanic next week. Just don't do it because you will die. Now, Edith was powerful enough within her family to come out and she persuaded all of them, and the Vanderbilts themselves had all booked passage on the Titanic. She persuaded the lot of them to not go, to delay, saying there was problems with the boat and, you know, it needed to make one voyage before they could sail in it, not the maiden voyage. And they didn't. And as a result, their lives were saved unlike that of their poor servant who they sent on the Titanic with all their luggage and he was never seen again. But I like that one. That's one of my favourite predictions. When she died, it was a huge deal. I mean, the Romanies really do know how to hold a funeral, but not one tear was shed at this funeral because it is well known. Tears disturb the repose of the dead. Actually, that's a very English sentiment, that, because English have this stiff upper lip and, you know, you don't cry at funerals. When my mother died, I remember her saying to me beforehand, do not cry, darling, at my funeral. I think it's very upsetting for everybody else. 
And so myself and all my siblings standing around completely dry eyed, <laughs> being very manly. It was very difficult. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was right or not, but I would no more defy my mother, even though she's now dead, than I would have done when she was alive. So, so because the gypsies are so intertwined with crystal ball philosophy and use, I would like to give you their method of how to use a crystal ball. Now, of course, when a crystal ball comes into your possession, the first thing that you must do is make sure you cleanse it. The gypsy said that you could use a solution of brandy and water, polish it up nicely, and then you need to charge it. Now, crystal balls should never come into contact with sunlight. This is not just because the crystal ball is guided by the moon, but because sunlight is eminently dangerous. I had a crystal ball which I left on my wooden table in the centre of my room and I couldn't understand why I kept on seeing scorch marks on my table. <laughs> Instead of every couple of days or so I'd see a new scorch mark and I couldn't work. I thought the children must have been burning matches on the table or something and it only turned out that actually the sun was hitting the crystal ball and as the light diffracts through it, it was burning my table. It is so strong that you can burn down your house and people have known houses to be burnt because the crystal ball has been touched by the sun. So during the day, it's very important to keep a cloth on top of your crystal ball. And of course, the traditional cloth for this was always velvet. However, I don't think it really matters. You could use silk, I have a silk handkerchief, or you could use velvet, or you could use whatever you think is particularly attractive. I think as long as the ball is covered, that's the main thing. So when you have cleansed your crystal ball, the next thing to do is to make sure it's charged. Now, traditionally, the crystal ball is beloved by the moon, and so therefore you must charge it by moonlight. You need three nights of charging, and the last night should be the night of a full moon, so that as you're charging your crystal ball, it will come to fruition with the night of the full moon. Do not let the ball sit on the windowsill or wherever you have placed it during the day because you need to cover it so that the sun doesn't touch it. Now this charging is also very good when you feel your crystal ball has lost a bit of its energy or its oomph or you're not getting clear signals from it. Put it back on the windowsill to be charged by the light of the moon ending with the full moon on the third night. Now, some Romanies would allow the person they were giving the reading to to hold the crystal ball in their left hand whilst they gazed into its sphere and gave their predictions. However, a lot of others said that this is not really appropriate because that person can impart negative energy into the ball and therefore you have to go through a lot of cleansing and smudging and clearing to ensure that there's none surrounding it. So it's up to you whether you allow another person to touch your crystal ball or not. I am personally of the opinion that it's best not. Now traditionally, when you're reading a crystal ball, it should be done by the light of a candle. So make sure you're in a darkened room, as all those gypsy tents were in the old days. If you ever went into them, you went into the murky depths of a gypsy tent, they would light some candles and they, the seer would then gaze into the murky depths of the orbs. Likewise, we need to look at a crystal ball through the light of a candle. Before you start any crystal gazing session, I like to give a little cleanse with a joss stick to my crystal ball, just to ensure that any of my negativity has not been attached to the sphere. You want to sit there and hold the energy of the person you're reading for, whoever that is, and the crystal ball together and try and combine them into the orb of the crystal ball. This is quite a difficult thing to do, but the best way I would suggest is to sit, place your hands close to the crystal ball and then put your energy and try and imagine and visualise yourself putting the energy from the person who you are reading into the ball to see what you can see. Then you can start gazing. Gaze into the ball. Let your eyes go unfocused. It is said that mists of time, space and people will rise up from the innards of the crystal ball as you gaze within its depths. And these will give you the view of the future. 
finally, the last thing that we need to do is to break the connection with the crystal ball when you have finished. And I find, personally, I don't know how you will do it, but personally I find the easiest way to do this is to visualise me putting all the energy that I've taken and all the visions and all the sights and sounds and seeing that I have taken from the crystal ball and to visualise putting it back. I then give it a quick smudge with a joss stick and cover the ball to wait for its next session. Now, my particular talent is not crystal ball gazing. It's not something that I would say I have a great affinity for. However, you might. So I'm really interested to know your thoughts on this. Do you have a crystal ball? How do you read the crystal ball? Let me know in the comments below. And lastly, I would just like to announce that I personally have solved Christmas. Should you be worrying about what to get your family and friends, there is now the wonderful Ginny Metherill gift voucher. These are for one-to-one -one sessions with me. They start from as little as £10. I have put all the details concerning the gift voucher in the details below so you can have a look how to order them, how much and what you get. They are all done on Zoom. They are all done with payment through PayPal so you're completely protected. And these will be perfect to give the loved ones in your life for a little stocking filler. So have a look in the description below. Give me an email at ginnymetherall at gmail.com if you would like one. In the meantime, don't forget to like and subscribe because some of you have been watching without subscribing. The audacity. And I will see you in a couple of days.